So maybe uh, just to kind of recap uh, where you were from the uh, team-based learning and that, that previous case history. Uh, first of all, Earth is made up and can be characterized by a range of physical properties. You looked at about five of them during that uh, case history with the, the tour around Ireland. So I think that kind of gives you some essence about geophysics and you know different problems are really associated with different physical properties and uh, you know singling that out and then carrying out the proper experiment uh, can help you solve the problem. Then everything is can be put into uh, this seven-step uh, process. So that's going to be a theme for the whole course. That's the way we can always kind of ground ourselves and remember what problem we're working on, what data we are, what we, data we have, and, and how we're uh, doing things. The other, and that is also, I think, very important here, is that knowledge of a single physical property does not tell you the answer. There are some cases where you know, it's pretty diagnostic. Um, you know, if you're looking for, you know, for a tunnel, for instance, or maybe you can just get by with a gravity experiment and, and do density. But in general, the Earth is pretty complicated. And we need to characterize it and answer your, your problem. Uh, you need to do, have a number of different physical properties, and you need to do a number of surveys. Uh, and then the examples, I think, that, 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 that showed that were that the gravel quarries, uh, we needed both the conductivity as well as elastic parameters, so both providing independent information. Even that karst investigation, that combination of density and conductivity turned out to be important. And in mining, uh, conductivity and, and chargeability. So I think those are some big kind of take home messages from from that, and uh, that's kind of an introduction to our next topic, which is the first of our different kinds of uh, surveys, and that is magnetic survey. So this is what we're going to concentrate on for the next uh, two weeks, and today really what I want to do is basically kind of give you an introduction, we're going to uh, just start to get a a sense about what the magnetic experiment is and uh, give you an initiation to a, an app that uh, you can develop, a little notebook that you can use to, uh, to, to help learn. So here's our principles for, for geophysics. Uh, always we can write these three types of uh, boxes. And this is how we always kind of communicate. So we've got some part, some problem, uh, scientific, engineering question, whatever. And that stimulates the thought of which physical properties we're going to be are going to be important. Once we decide on that, then that's where the geophysics comes in. And here's where we think about you know, what survey do we want to use, what data we're going to collect, what's the processing, what's the inversion. So we kind of do the work in here. So here's the realm of the geophysicist in here. And then conveys that information back about the physical properties back to the person who initially had the problem. So the person who initially had the problem may not be a geophysicist, probably isn't, and may not know very much about geophysics at all. But here's the way in which they communicate. They communicate through these physical properties. That means that this question has to be addressed, or it has to be um, formulated in terms somehow of physical properties. And when there's a physical property that comes back, that provides some information as to the answer of that geologic question. So that's the way it always works. The geophysicist over here, geologist, engineer here, and they're kind of communicating through physical properties and images and that sort of fundamental understanding of what the problem is. Now in the magnetic survey, again, this is uh, kind of a characteristic picture. We're going to see this actually for every survey because 
every geophysical survey has the following. It has a source. That source puts energy into the ground. We have some physical property in, in, the, in the ground. In this case, it's going to be magnetic susceptibility. And then we're going to measure a response. So that's always the way it works. We've got source, put some energy in. That energy travels through the Earth in such a way that it's uh, dependent upon this physical property. And then it gives rise to fields that could be measured at the Earth's surface or in the air. And we get these, get these data. The geophysical survey. Just a couple of uh, uses for our particular physical property, which is magnetic susceptibility. There's a whole host of them. Um, there's geologic mapping, looking for ore deposits, uh, geotechnical problems, unexplored ordinances, sometimes just to try to find building foundations or sometimes in archaeological work. Actually, I think of all of the types of surveys in geophysics, I would guess that magnetics is the most routinely used. And it's because it just has these applications in all of these, these different areas. So whether you're an archaeologist or whether you're a mineral explorationist, uh, you use exactly the same equipment and exactly the same type of uh, physics. So here's uh, one of the really big uses of uh, magnetic surveying. And that is that just by looking at the data, we can often make uh, inferences about what the geology is. So what we have on the map on the left hand side here is so we've got a geologic map. Uh, I don't exactly know what it is, but we've got different units that, that are coming through here. And each of these has been you know, mapped by people on the ground and they've recognized that these are these are different rocks. Okay? Take that same area, you go over it with a magnetic survey, and you just plot the data, and there's your data. Well, you take a look at this, and you take a look at this, and you start to see that, wait a minute, there's all kinds of things that are coming in. Like this, this great big uh, contact that's going in here you know, is clearly in here. This guy that's coming out in here it's here. And in fact, this whole unit that's coming in here you know, can be seen all, all the way through here. So just by looking at the data, you can, and if you have some kind of connection with what's there, uh, you can get a lot of information. Out. And in fact, this is one of the biggest ways that magnetics is used for geologic mapping, because you go out and you might map, you know, a little corner of, of, of things out here, or maybe you map something out here, maybe something out here. So you're, you're not able to cover all of the ground, right? But you cover parts of it, and you recognize, OK, that's rock type 1, that's rock type 2, that's rock type 3. And then you come over here, and you say, oh, wait a minute. I can see that contact going all the way up. So I think this is rock 1, and this is rock 2. And uh, you can see how you can kind of fill that information. So it's very valuable. and has got one of the biggest usages uh, for this kind of survey. The other that we've talked about before, and I won't dwell on this, is that you could do more analysis with, with the data and get that same data set and invert it to get uh, a 3D image. So now you're looking down into the ground and getting uh, some idea about what the, what the structure is at depth. And another image that I've shown you a couple of times before is also with respect to uh, unexploded ordinances. So now this is a small scale. So the, you know, the, the, we're kind of going down in scale. So that first one was very large scale. Then we had the sort of deposit. And now we're looking at just the UXO here. And we're getting out some magnetic data, which is very informative about where this object is, as well as uh, you know, maybe something about the, the, the type of it. So this is another, I think, important lesson about geophysics. And it's, it's one of the reasons it makes it so valuable, and that is that it's, it's scalable. 
the physics doesn't change, and very often the instruments don't don't change. You can apply the same kind of experiment at scales of hundreds of kilometers as you do at tens of centimeters. It's exactly the same physics, exactly the same kind of transmitters and receivers, although they might be scaled down a bit, but nothing else changes. So that's great, right? Because that means that if you learn something within one particular context, you can realize that, oh, it's applicable in a whole bunch of other uh, areas. So we're going to uh, talk about Earth materials. Uh, and in particular, we're going to talk about magnetism. So everybody's more than familiar with these guys. Remember, you uh, had, uh, had these when you were no kids, right? And so we'll continually be talking about magnets. We'll talk about these as dipoles. And we'll also talk about poles. So there might be a south pole and a north pole of a, of a magnet. The magnetic field lines from this magnet look like something like this. The convention is that the magnetic field lines emanate from the north and they go into the south. That's, that's our convention. So if uh, at the Earth's north pole, for instance, where the magnetic field is, is coming down, okay, that's actually indicating that what is up in the north is really our, our, our south pole. This is actually a diagram that is really good to kind of uh, get used to because we're going to be doing a lot of work where we just have a little magnetic dipole. I'm going to say, ah, I've got a little you know, magnetic dipole. And you know, I'm going to draw the magnetic field lines that are associated with this. And they're going to look like this. So you're going to be doing a lot of sketches like this. You might as well just kind of get, get familiar with that because the magnetic dipole is really a characteristic signature of a lot of uh, types of bodies that we have and also from the point of view of fundamental energy. Uh, another term that we're going to talk about is the dipole moment. So this is going to be the strength of, of the dipole. And yeah, that's the only extra thing on, the, on this slide. So this dipole, this dipole is going to have a direction indicated by this arrow. The magnetic field, the, the point of the arrow is at the North Pole. The magnetic fields are going to come like this. And this guy here is going to have a strength to it. And we're going to denote that by a small letter M. And we'll put a vector sign over top of it to indicate that it's got some direction. So the little magnetic dipole yep, could be this way. So it would be a strength this way, and the lines are coming up like this. Or it could be tilted on the side and coming like that. You know, that's how we're going to describe it. Always a strength and some kind of a direction. So where do magnetic fields come from? If I was to ask people what's what's the origin of magnetic fields, we're all familiar with them. What's uh, what's your, what's your take on? Where these things come from? Yeah, Earth's magnetic field, anyways, from the, the convection and the liquid odor core, isn't it? Okay. So we've got the Earth's field. So here's our Earth. We've got the mantle, we've got the inner core, we've got the outer core that is liquid. And there's convection that's that's going through here, and what is convecting are uh, metallic particles that are going through. Moving uh, a moving metallic particle is effectively like a moving charge, and that's actually giving rise to. Good. So that's the, that's the Earth's field, and we'll talk about that later. But the Earth's field is actually just the same as if you had. You know, a dipole that's sitting just just like this, and then you know the magnetic field kind of 
circulates around them. Okay, but the, so that was good. General question, where do magnetic fields come from? Anybody? They just exist. <laughs> So there was a lot about that that was was, was right. If, if I, and that, I mean that, that's kind of how that's kind of how generators work, right? So if I have a magnetic field and I've got you know an armature, or some kind of a conductor that's moving through there, then I've got flux. I've got time rate of change of flux. That's generating that generates a current. Okay. Perfect. Okay. But this guy here is magnetic. Why is he magnetic? of the electrons and the protons of the material. Pretty close. It was the word distribution that needs to get quantified. Anybody? Orientation. Distribution of positively charged ions and negatively charged No. All of the magnetic fields that we have arise from currents. A current is, you know, if you look at what a current is, it's the number of charged particles that go by you per second. So if you look at an atom, okay, so if I have a nucleus, right, and I've got an electron that's spinning around, this guy, you know, he's just going, you know, no, no, no. This, so you could sit here and you could count like the number of charges, you know, per second that's that's going around, and that would be a current. So this guy here that's moving around is just like a little loop of current, and a loop of current actually gives rise to a magnetic field that looks just like a dipole. So the origin of all of our magnetic fields comes from. Uh, you know, actually microscopic structures that are going on in, in, in this magnet where we've got particles that have, uh, well, nuclei that have particles that are going around them that are somehow spinning. In fact, protons themselves can spin, the electrons can spin, everything's spinning, and every time you get a spinning kind of current like that, you end up, well, every time you get a spinning charge, you get a current, and currents get magnetic. So everything comes from that. And that's actually what happened back here, too. We've got these charges, uh, electronic charges in here that are just moving, and they give rise to a magnetic field. So the bottom line is that each elementary, uh, well, each, each molecule that we have, or each uh, atomic nuclei, actually has a magnetic moment. The fundamentals are that if I have a little current that's going around like this, it's actually going to give rise to a magnetic field that looks just like a little bar magnet. And so this quantity here just acts like a little bar magnet. So you can have things in here. You can imagine everything that we've got is actually made up of particles which have some intrinsic magnetic moment to them. Now, if all of those magnetic moments are just ramble shambled, right, then we don't see anything net from them. But if they are aligned in, in some way, then we can actually get a cumulative effect that is, uh, is really observable. So we're going to be thinking about elements that, you know, have a, each particle might have an intrinsic magnetic uh, moment. And the units of that is amp meter squared. Kind of comes back to this guy here. So we've got a current I and an area here. And it's the product of those two things that gives us the magnetic moment. What we are interested in, watch, we're interested in both of them. 
But there's another quantity that we're going to be working with uh, a great deal, and it's called the magnetization. So the magnetization is just the total magnetic moment divided by the volume. So in other words, if we took a whole bunch of particles in here, added up all of their magnetic moments, and now we have to do the directional stuff too, right? Because this guy's pointing in this way, this guy's pointing in this way, we have to add all the things together. So we would get you know, a total magnetic moment from that, the sum of all of the individual ones. And then we just divide it by the volume, and now we've got something, a magnetization, that is independent of the size of the object. So a, an object could have a magnetization, you know, this, this object could have a magnetization, a bigger object would have, could have the same magnetization. So the units of magnetization are basically dipole moment per unit volume. And when the particles are distri distributed randomly, uh, there's no net magnetization. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of that in, in a second. So another thing about uh, magnets, magnetization, is that uh, opposite poles. It's there. I was going to ask you a question, but that's not thank you. So opposite poles attract, right? Light poles repel. It's kind of hard to put, put these together. If I take this magnet, and if I had another magnet, this one's kind of big, but let's kind of get the idea. If, if I have this other magnet in the presence of this magnet, it's actually going to align itself up with the, with, with the magnetic field. It's perhaps most easily shown in this diagram here. You, you, you remember doing this in, I don't know. Right. five signs or something, whenever you do that, you take a bar magnet, right, put it under a piece of paper, take some iron filings, shake, 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 right, and then you look at this kind of amazing pattern that comes out where all of these little iron filings just line up with what this main bar magnet is. So these actually show you what the field lines are. So we've got a lot of things that actually come out of here. So here's our here's our bar magnet. And each little iron particle, you know, is like a little bar magnet. And it aligns itself up with the direction of the earth or of this field at this at this particular point. And you can just by watching them see, okay, here's how the field lines look of this kind of extended bar magnet. So the takeaway lessons in here is that if I have a little magnet in the presence of some larger magnetic field, the little guy lines up. That's actually what's going to happen for our earth, earth material, because all of our pieces that make up the earth uh, material, they're all like little magnets. Some are a bit stronger than others, but each of them kind of has that capability and if I apply a big magnetic field on, it's going to line up. So the magnet magnetic susceptibility. So here's our here's our word that we're using. We're going to denote it by the Greek letter kappa. That tells us basically how easy it is for this rock to get magnetized when there's an external field applied. So when I say the word external field, I'm talking about this big field that's coming on. That's the forcing field. And then if this thing has a, has a high susceptibility, it like immediately lines up and it's got a big strength. If it has a low susceptibility, it's really not very much uh, affected. Okay. So susceptibility is the physical property that's going to be characteristic of you. It's going to tell us, effectively it's going to tell us how many like iron types of particles are in the, in the material 
and uh, yeah, how strong a magnet I can uh, generate if I apply something else. So the idea here was that if we take uh, you know a little bit of earth material, we look at the individual pieces inside. You know, they're all little magnets and lining up in a whole bunch of different directions. Right? I apply an earth field. And I'm going to denote that magnetic field by H. And I get these guys all lining up. And so now, if I count these and divide by the volume, I'm going to have the net magnetization. So if we look at rocks and earth materials, uh, this is a really interesting diet. You know, you guys have a really sharp, can you see that in here? It's, uh, uh, you got you, you to have astigmatism to kind of see <laughs> There's other seats in there. You could even sit in front. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this unit on the top, this is a logarithmic scale. That's 1, and this is 10 to the minus 5, and this is in SI units, so System International. And if we look at these various quantities in here, you see that they cover huge ranges. So sedimentary rocks can have a set, uh, susceptibility of 10 to the minus 5, pretty small number, you know, all the way up to, well, kind of 10 to the minus 3, but then, you know, a few of them can be even bigger. Metamorphic rocks are here. Granites tend to generally be just a little bit higher, and there's two types of granites. There's S types and T types. There's basalts. Notice basalts are kind of getting up towards this edge up here, so they've got, they've got a higher magnetic uh, susceptibility. Iron, there's, for those people who did the labs, you already would have discovered that. For the other people, you get to discover that this afternoon. Uh, there's a couple of different kinds of iron. There's hematite and magnetite. Hematite's not particularly magnetic, but magnetite is the huge kid on the block. And in fact, it turns out that magnetite, for most of the things that you know, we're concerned with in geological engineering or in, in geology, we get rocks that are, are magnetic, and generally, it's pretty related to how much magnetite we have. And that's why on this diagram up here, there's another scale that says, if you're up here at uh, a susceptibility of one, it's like having sort of 20% magnetite, and uh, at point one, you're, you're, you're down. So magnetite's really huge. And yeah, magnetite, it's got a little whole bunch of iron particles, so you can see how all of that kind of So now let's go back to our magnetic survey. I want to take you through the source. We've already talked a little bit about the physical property, and I really would like to get on to the response. So now we were just discussing this, right? So the, what is going to be the source field for all of our magnetic experiments is just a natural source. We don't have to, ordinarily in geophysics, we have to make our own source, right? So we get a whole bunch of wires and generators and stuff like that. But in, in this case, we're provided uh, with the natural source, and that's just the magnetic field of the Earth, which comes through process that we're talking about, the magnetic dynamo. These fields were all due to currents that were inside the, you know, below the mantle between the inner core and the outer core. And the convective motions inside the core are turbulent. I mean, it's uh, 
stuff's going all over the place at different scales. And if you're actually able to look at what the magnetic field lines were really just really on the outside of that core material, you find it's really complicated. However, the one thing about uh, magnetic fields is that what, the farther you get away from an object, the less kind of structure you see in those magnetic fields. And by the time you get far enough away, the, the thing that is dominant is just the simplest expression, which is basically like a dipole. So there's, I'm sure they're used to multipole expansions, but the, you know, you got monopole, dipole, quadrupole, octopole, dot, 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 right? All which have more features. We don't have monopoles in magnetics. There's no magnetic charges per se, but we do have dipoles. And when we look, we step far enough away from the center of the Earth, this is what the magnetic field looks like. It looks just like a dipole. To first order. Uh, the best fitting dipole is actually one that uh, isn't aligned with the spin axis, although we often make that assumption. But it's uh, tilted a bit from the, the spin axis, as well as it's kind of shifted off the, from the center of the, of, of the core. But you know, uh, magnetic dipole is a really good approximation to what the Earth's field is, providing we're looking at it at the surface of the Earth, or even better, as we go farther away. The situation is, is actually more complicated uh, and it's kind of wonderfully complicated in, in a way. This is cartoon drawing. So this is the sun. So this is definitely not scale. Um, what we're seeing, it, well, does anybody know what we're seeing? Okay. Any, anybody got some idea about what that picture is telling us? The idea of what this is, this stuff is, this stuff. That's solar wind. Good. So we've got these flares on the earth, on the sun, solar wind coming up here, right? That's actually that's carrying with it a magnetic field, right? And now the Earth, just think about the Earth all by itself, it's got a magnetic field. So two magnetic fields have to interact. And we already could kind of see how they would interact just by looking through those cycles. And so now we get this uh, region of interaction. There's actually a shock wave that occurs here. This is called the bow shock. And the magnetosphere, the field of the Earth, actually takes this form. It's just like there's, in fact, you can see why they call it solar wind, because it's just like you took this and you just, you just blew it back, right? So here's the magnetic field lines. On this side, they're compressed. On this side, they're simply blown out. So that's what things look like. We're going to talk more about this towards the end of the course because all the stuff that's going on in here actually causes you know, a lot of charged particles to come into here. We're affected by solar storms. In fact, there's solar weather. You can sign up to see what the solar weather is like. That's really important for satellite communications because uh, big solar storms can really inhibit uh, communications. Big solar storms can also cause incredible havoc with our electrical power grids because they can induce power surges and you know there's been big blackouts all over North America at times in the past all because of this. So there's a lot of stuff happening, it's very interesting, uh, but from our perspective right now, what we're sitting with is we've got an earth, it's got a magnetic field inside and around this outside here, uh, things are kind of going to look a little bit like a, sort of like a magnetic uh, dipole. And that's actually going to be the source field for magnetizing the rocks in here. A couple of just quick note, notations. I'm not going to dwell on this now. We'll come back a little bit more, but I just, I, I need to introduce these symbols to you, and then we'll kind of come back. There's a symbol B 
that we use. It's the magnetic flux density. You, you mentioned flux. So B, that's, what, that's what this is. So B is the magnetic flux density. It's got a unit, Weber per meter squared, which is equal to a Tesla. Not the same one that uh, Elon Musk has generated, but you don't drive this guy. So. Come on, you guys can laugh. <laughs> Goodness, I had a class one time. Honestly, they were. <sighs> you know, sometimes you say things that are just like they're really funny, right? <laughs> and, and, and then you look around and everybody's ready to go. Give me a break. Okay. Um, whoops. So. A Tesla. Uh, a Tesla is actually a really big guy. It's a, it's a big number. Uh, for the Earth's field, we're going to use micro Teslas uh, or maybe even nano Teslas. Uh, that's actually nano Teslas, which is 10 to the minus 9. Uh, we're going to, to, to use a lot. The magnetic field, or sometimes called the magnetic field intensity, is written by the letter H. And it's got different units. It's amps per meter. So this is a field. That's a flux. The two are related through a physical property called magnetic permeability. So that the B, the flux, is equal to mu times H. And the magnetic permeability is equal to mu naught this is the magnetic permeability of free space into 1 plus kappa. Here's our susceptibility. This is the guy that we're basically interested in. The magnetic permeability arises because of our system of units. And we think about it uh, as just this number. It's 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. And it actually has units, Henry's per meter. But not OK, so. I, I want to mention this because we're going to kind of casually interchange these two things. We might sometimes call B the magnetic field. We might sometimes call H the magnetic field. But we will always keep the lettering sacred so that when you see a B, you know you're talking about Teslas. We see an H, we know we're talking about uh, F the readers. And this is the relationship between them. So what we notice here is that for our Earth field, we have something that, that looks like this. And actually, the I, I mentioned that the fields, magnetic field lines, come like this. So they're pointing down here. So that must be the south pole of the magnet. It's the north pole. Even though when we talk about things, we say, oh, well, there's the north magnetic pole. But we're going to call it the North Magnetic Pole, but really, it's related to the South Pole or the magnet inside here. And importantly, if you look at the direction, so these are vectors, and they have both a length and a direction. If we look at the magnetic field at the surface of the Earth, you find that at the equator, it's pointing up like this. And then as we go down, towards the North Pole, it gradually goes like this, so at the North Magnetic Pole, it puts vertically down. The takeaway message here, which is extremely important, is that the magnetic field in place on the Earth varies both in strength and in direction. So how do we, uh, how do we capture that? Uh, for everybody who uses a compass, what's the thing that you're always looking at with respect to a compass? What's it telling you? Magnetic declination. It tells you the magnetic declination, and the declination is? The difference between geographic north and magnetic. So that's the declination, and it's positive if you go uh, to, to the east. So we have a declination here, I think about 20 degrees, something like that. The other thing, and you don't notice that too much on your magnetic compasses, but uh, there's, if you had one that actually pivoted on a needle point, you'd find that it 
points down. And that angle between the horizontal and where that magnetic field is going is the inclination. So we've got the declination, the inclination, those are two angles. We also need a length, and so there's a length of, of a vector. So this vector here of the Earth's field has got a, a length to it, and it's got two angles, and that describes it. So our magnetic field can be described in terms of a magnitude, inclination, and declination. But just like any vector, it can also be described in terms of components. If I had an X, Y, Z coordinate system here, I can measure an X component, a Y component, and a Z component. And that's an equally valid way of, uh, of representing it. So in that case, I've got X, Y, or Z, and here I've got inclination, declination. Compass, declination, first uh, OK, so let's just look a little bit at what the um, Earth's field is like. So this is a Mercator projection. This bar that we have here uh, is in nanoteslas, so that's telling us something about B. And it goes 20 at the bottom, 20,000 to 70,000. Actually, when you use some of the apps on the uh, on your iPhones or something, they'll often do it in micro Teslas. Uh, that would be sensible when we're talking about the Earth's field, but a lot of anomalies that we have are really kind of small. They're you know, like hundreds of nanoteslas, so those are small numbers. That's why we tend to use nanoteslas. The take-home thing here is that you notice that the fields around the equator here are actually pretty small. They're more like 20, 25,000 compared to the fields at the poles, both the North Pole and, and the South Pole, which are like 70,000. So if we come back to this, uh, here's our Earth, here's our, our magnetic field. You know, you've got sort of like 70,000 nanoteslas here, the magnetic field, and it's pointing pretty down. Magnetic field here is sort of 20,000 and it's pointing horizontal. So that's the total field strength. The declination depends upon where you are. So if you're looking at Vancouver, for instance, in here, we've got a declination of something in the order of you know, 20 odd degrees. But you can see that the declination, the angle between where your compass is and true north, uh, can vary greatly on, on the Earth. And the inclination, this is a, a, a simpler map, and it follows exactly what you would have expected from this diagram here. So the inclination, the uh, just Basically, the angle between how it's pointing, where the vector is pointing, and the horizontal is like 90 degrees here, zero here, and then minus 90 here. So if, the, if we're sitting on the Earth's surface and the magnetic field is pointing down, that's a positive inclination. If it's pointing up, as it does in the southern hemisphere, it's a negative inclination. Okay, so that's the source. Susceptibility, we've kind of already talked about. So now that brings us to how do we put all of that stuff to, together. So here's basically the, the principles of the magnetic survey. So we've got an Earth steel that gives rise to magnetic field, differs every place on the Earth. The Material inside the Earth gets magnetized depending upon its susceptibility and the magnetic field strength. The magnetization, which is the dipole moment per unit volume, is given by this number. So that tells us now how inside the Earth each little part is actually magnetized. So now when we 
Now that we have that, then we need to say, okay, now I've got some, I've got a little prism in here or whatever. It's magnetized in a particular direction, and that is going to give rise to its own magnetic field. So now I can imagine this is a bar magnet in here. It gives rise to a, to a magnetic field. Yes, and now we've got. Uh, uh, so now we've got magnetic fields that are coming from this, and now we're going to come along here, and we're going to measure them. And the thing about what we're going to measure is that we can measure uh, like an individual component here, or we could measure a strength, so we could measure a whole bunch of things. And so to kind of get a, a, some idea about what it is, the what your signature is going to be for your data, uh, we need to be able to have some way of, uh, of, of modeling it. And I think, yes. So let me, okay. So we have uh, what's called a notebook. So this is something that's written in Python. It's, it's called a Jupyter Notebook. And it is uh, an app that's been generated by this incredible group of students that we have here, researchers, uh, that are, when you play with it, when you use this, uh, we're hoping that you can actually learn a great deal of art. So I'm going to spend just a a moment kind of showing you sort of what it is that you can, that you can look at, you can download. There'll be information on the website of exactly how to, uh, you know, how to get this and how to uh, start to work with it. But when you're, when you, when you see this, uh, there's a number of, for, for people who are not familiar with this, there, there's a number of cells things that look like this that actually have to be run throughout the uh, throughout the app. Uh, you can, however, just come up to this thing up here called cell, and then you can run all, and then everything is kind of activated. The thing I wanted to just show you here is sort of generally, whoops, Ah. Yeah. So, first of all, there's there's a little bit of background information about defining the, the, the field. Okay, so we've kind of just gone over that. Right? So we've got the first field someplace that's got uh, particular strength and inclination and declination. And then we need to make a body. So you, you have a variety of uh, slider bars here that are going to uh, allow you to make a prism. Do you have a prism up here? Ah, here we go. So you're going to have a 3D cube. These cubes can have whatever dimension you like. And you can put into that cube or into this sort of volume uh, a prism. The starting values of doing a prism, you're going to set something. It's got you know, a length in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. I'll show you in a second. And then you can bury this to as much as you want. And you can also kind of tilt this guy around as, as much as you want. So the first thing in here is to you know, decide what kind of an object you want to investigate and to try to see what their signature is. So we're going to build this guy. And these are the parameters that allow you to do that. I don't have enough time to kind of carry through, but the dx, dy, dz, so that's the x, y, z lengths of the body. There's a depth. Talk about those later. And then there's also uh, a height at which your uh, observer, your 
uh, observation plane is going to be. And there's an X limb and Y limb that kind of tells you the size of your of the area. So we've got an area that we're, we've got a volume that we're going to generate something in. Okay, we made that. We've got an area over which we're going to collect data, and we can specify how often we want to collect data, and then we're going to go out and do that numerical simulation, and then see what we got. The applet, and you can try to see how how, how well you do, uh, is. You get to define the susceptibility of the block, okay? And then these things here, E inc and E dec, are the inclination and declination of the Earth's field, okay? So that's what's going to magnetize the object, okay? And then you can also set the strength of the Earth's field. So once you've done that, that now magnetizes the object. That's going to generate the field, the anomalous field that you're looking at, and then you can then uh, measure either a BX, a BY, or a BZ component. Don't think about this for a moment, but just kind of think about measuring three components. And when you do that, for instance, in this case here, let me not do the Dead. So this is what the BZ component of that particular object would be. And then here's a profile that goes over here. Okay? So on the web on the EOS site, there'll be a way to access this. So if by Friday you could have taken a shot at this guy, just read the stuff up there, just play around with it just a, just a little bit. And you'll, you'll start to kind of get a feeling for what's going on. And the important thing is to uh, ultimately to kind of think about, okay, what would happen if you collected data over just a line here? And could you, could you, carry, you, know, could you sketch out the signature of what you're going to get, namely something like this, just by kind of thinking about how the magnetic field, how this body is. Okay, a couple of, uh, a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, uh, for, if anybody hasn't signed the video permission form, uh, could you just let us know? And we've got a couple of extras up here that you can do. Uh, we also need to have your email IDs. So uh, if you can sign onto the EOS website, and there's a Google Doc there, put your email ID in there so that we can email you. Because one of the first things that we're going to email you with, or maybe we'll have it up on the site, is that we want to have you download a magnetic app that can just measure the magnetic field. For those people who did the uh, lab on Monday, you'll have seen this. For the rest of you, you'll see it today. But it, so Friday, we're just going to do uh, kind of like a simulation of a, of a geophysical survey where you're going to try to use your iPhones just to see if you couldn't find, you know, a very magnetic object or something. It, it just kind of puts things in perspective. It's, it's kind of a simple thing, but it sort of puts them in perspective. And it's like, oh, I kind of get the idea why you might want to do Jupiter. And then, uh, yeah, the Jupiter notebook, if you can download that, give that shot, you're good to go. Thanks. So, so, yeah.